Hello, I'm Ken Schoen. Today I have the distinct honor of interviewing Betty Hollingsworth, who's going to be talking to us about her memories of the village of South Deerfield. Welcome, Betty. Thank you, Ken, and thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to tell my story. Can you tell us the different businesses that were in downtown South Deerfield, business by business? So Spencer's store, for instance, where was that? Well, Spencer's store was located up on North Main Street. We lived at 230 North Main Street and they were right next door. And it was just a small building, but uh, it was run by Nathan and Lulu Spencer. They had no children. Um, they, they stocked a few canned goods, loaves of bread, milk, coal meats, cheeses, ice cream, a lot of penny candy, and tobacco. And they also had a small area of the, the room of the building that they reserved for high school students because in my day there was no cafeteria. We had no prepared lunches at school. We had to bag lunch if we, if we, I walked home for lunch because school went from nine to three. We had an hour off for lunch and I walked from my house to, to school to my house and my house to school, back to school. But if, if the, we were bus students, they couldn't go home for lunch. So they took their lunch and they would go over to Spencer's store and he would, they would have soda because he had soda pop also at that time. And they would sit down and have their was lunch. Was this directly next to where the high school this was today? This was just, uh, Spencer's store was located one, one building north of the white house that's located to the right of the high school right at the driveway of the high school and this was a small building now today if you went by you could not tell it was a house can you tell me some of the other businesses in south deerfield billings, block by block perhaps. billings drugstore used to be uh, managed by a man by the name of mr hal roach uh, he started the business and then it uh, was bought out by hollis billings and i don't have a date that hollis bought it but he was there when I came to town, so it had to be 1930. Where was the building store, this pharmacy, drugstore, soda fountain? Where was that located? That was located in the center of South Deerfield on Sugarloaf Street, approximately opposite the Common. And there was a structure built because on the right-hand side, as we were looking at it, towards South Main Street was built the structure that was known as Putts Block. And it was an old-fashioned two-story building that contained everything that you could ever want to buy in the olden days. If you went in there, you'd have to find pails and lanterns hanging from the ceiling and gas lights and uh, uh, tobacco, uh, chew tobacco. You could, you, could buy, you could buy penny candy, you could buy ice cream. Uh, they sold kerosene. They um, always probably had to pump it out of a, of a drum. And of course, in those days, the drum was sitting right there in the showroom. They didn't have to go out back for it because there were no codes to say they couldn't do that. And that was back in the days when it was just a walk back in time. It really was an old fashioned country store. And what years did it last till? Did it exist from when to when, would you say? It was torn down in about uh, 19, the late 1940s. Uh, it also had um, a living space up on the second floor, and it had a barber shop in the corner, down in, in the uh, corner toward South Main Street. So it, it, had, it was two businesses. And where was it located exactly in town? It was located where Cumberland Farms is located today, on uh, Sugarloaf Street, here in South Deerfield, right opposite the Common. And what, what replaced this building in 1940? Okay, a, a garage. Uh, an automotive garage, Rosenthal's garage, replaced it. And then um, he, his business was transferred over to where the Deerfield Pharmacy is now, and that's why they came in and raised the garage and put Cumberland Farms in. So Cumberland Farms has been there, not since I was a kid, but it's been there a number of years. Um, of course, the business was in attacked until Hollis was killed in the plane crash. And then his pharmacist, Don Wells, took over ownership of the building and he owned the business. And then after Don, while Don Wells was there, he employed Billy Ritkevitz as a pharmacist. And then Billy split off from there and set up his own pharmacy where Jerry's place is, which is right there on the corner of 
North Main Street and Elm Street. Um, Billy remained in business as a pharmacy for, oh, probably five years. And then he went out of business and went back to Billings Drugstore because then he took over from Don Wells when Don Wells retired. And what else was there next to the... Next door was the A&P store, the Atlantic and Pacific grocery store. Um, that was put in, it, it was there when I came because Mr. Graves, Herbert Graves, who lived on Graves Street, was um, the head grocer there. It was uh, just a small version of the A&P. And then um, there, was, there was nothing next to that. Where was that exactly? That, that, was next, that was adjacent to Hollings Billings. It was part of the building that Hollings Billings Drugstore was in, the Billings Drugstore. That uh, building next to that that is currently there was put in in later years. It was put in by um, Don Wells as a rental. I mean, they were going to rent it as an office of some kind. But in the, when the A when the A and P went out of business, that's when Tom Scanlon came in. But maybe not right away. It remained vacant for a while, and then Tom Scanlon put his business, his accounting business, in there, and it stayed until just a couple three years ago. When what's he, in the pharmacy right now? What's in that pharmacy yeah, right where now? Where buildings used to be. It, it's um, it's a pizza shop and a and a r restaurant. Um, Primo. Primos. That's correct. That's where that's that correct. was. Yes. Okay, let's go further down the street a little bit. Okay. What else was there? Now you have the driveway, the driveway that goes in out back. Out, if you drove in that driveway years ago, you would come to George Canning's blacksmith, blacksmith shop. And right that, behind it. That's right, what was right behind it. And in fact, it sits directly behind what is now known as the Daylily, which used to be George Gramacki's, which used to be Mrs. Ducharme's. Um, those were the former names of that particular building. But George Canning had a, a, a going business because he did all of the, well, whenever they were building a wagon or uh, they had cut the iron in there, um, he had a welding shop in there. And I can remember going there with my dad when we were going to have something done that my dad needed to, um, in, in carpentry, he need, might need a hinge or something forged. And so he would go into the blacksmith shop and they would do that. But then that got torn down. When did that leave town or get torn down? When did that end, that blacksmith shop? Well, it ended when George Canning died. Which is about? Mm, probably late 30s, early 40s. Not to be replaced. Not to be replaced. Nothing is there. Um, actually, what to go further down beyond the driveway, the store that I remember was Mrs. Ducharme, who ran um, the, a confectionery store, she sold ice cream. They had a fireworks stand out beside it during Fourth of July, a freestanding fireworks stand. There were two in town, that was one of them. And between the fireworks stand and, and Mrs. Uh, Ducharme's place was the First National. They had two grocery stores in town, the A&P and the First National. So um, we, that's where my mother did all of her trading. And there were, there were two men who ran the First National. There were the clerks in there. And you didn't go around and pick out the foods in those days. They went around and picked them out and then came back to the counter, wrote it down on the outside of the paper bag. And they had no calculators or no cash registers. And when it came the end of the time, they just ran their finger up that column and had the answer. What's in Ducharme's place now? Ducharme's was Mrs. Ducharme. What's and, there and now? Then it became um, then it became uh, the offices of George Gramacki, who was insurance and... Um, I remember that. I think maybe some real estate from there. And then when George um, vacated it, it, was, it, it stayed empty for a little while. And then the Daylily came in, and um, that's where the Daylily is located now. And the National was right next to it? Right next door, but it was a freestanding building. Free right standing. in the parking lot where Fisher's Garage is. Uh -huh. And then now that leads us to Fisher's Garage. And there was only a driveway between Fisher's Garage, which went out back because he had a, a lot out there that he, well, he, if the car was disabled, he would put it out there rather than leave it out front. There was no parking lot for him to put anything out front, as there is now. Because when the First National was demolished, then it became Fisher's Parking Lot. I think he bought it at that time. Tell us about the origins of Fisher's Garage. 
Oh, that goes way back. Uh, Fishers ran the bus that used to go from the Boston Main Railroad in Greenfield to the Weldon Hotel. That's how it started. And then he came down here and set up a bus line which went from Springfield to uh, Brattleboro, Vermont at least. And uh, the bus used to run on a daily schedule and it was, you could catch the bus in, I caught the bus in Sunderland to come home for lunch, had my lunch and then turned around and caught the bus back to Sunderland to work in the afternoon. How did it become a garage servicing cars? When did that happen? Well, I think that they originally serviced the buses there too. So uh -huh. it was a, a maintenance station for their equipment. And then it, when the cars started to become popular and a lot of people bought cars, then they started to have them whatever, have a motor job done on it or have the, the shocks changed or whatever was necessary at that time because cars in those days weren't quite as stable as they are today. Today you don't go into the garage very often to have all of those things done and, and we always made lots of trips in order to have that done. So Fisher's Garage was an active garage in town. How did the Morrow boys get the garage? What happened there? Fisher's Garage employed G.R. Fisher who was the founder it employed Pete Patterson, who was a, a, a town member, member of the fire department. It, it employed Ray Keyes, who happened to be the night telephone operator. He handled the phone switchboard during the night. And then Frank Morrow, who was the father of the two boys that took over the station. And now the two boys' sons are running the station because the two boys that had it have basically retired, of course. One is deceased and the other is, is still with us. Uh, was there a fish, shop, a fish uh, store also in town? Oh yes, just beyond Fisher's Garage. There, was, there's a, there still exists today the building and um, it was run by um, uh, Mr. Bradley, um, Ray Bradley's father. He ran the market and um, there were other people who worked there and they sold fish and they, fresh fish. Um, my mother used to go down and buy fresh fish on a Friday to have. Um, and then the other half, the back of the building, well, the, after, the, after the fish market left there, uh, Marcolia's barbershop went in. And that's where uh, Mr. Marcolia cut hair for a lot of years. And then on the other side was a beauty, beauty parlor, May to, uh, Redmond Tarati put her beauty parlor in there for a lot of years and then after May sold her business then it was run by Josie Maleshko. She had her party but before that May was located in the Lathrop house. She had where the subway has the sandwich shop that was May Tarati's beauty parlor and I can remember having the last one of the old-fashioned permanents where they rolled your hair up on those metal curlers and ran wires to the ceiling and ran the electricity through it and then you got your hair frizzled and it was frizzled. I only got that one time and then after that I went to the new conventional permanence. Let's go back to the um, fish store and the hairdresser. What's there today? There is a computer store in one side and it used to be Charsky's insurance agency after Marcolia's barber shop. And I believe the Recorder Gazette had an office in the little office, which is toward the east most part of the building on Sugarloaf Street. And um, home health care. Home health care is in there right now. Okay. Right. So let's go now around to the hotels. Okay. We started talking about them. Um, tell me about the different hotels, about Redmond Hall, about the hotels, and what happened, and why there were so many fires. What's well, that about? Let me start with the, with the um, Hotel Warren, because that was out next to the railroad. It got a lot of customers who came through on the railroad, uh, had wanted a place to stay because they boarded people. And Mrs. Ahern ran the, the hotel, and of course she had a fine restaurant there. It was a good eating place. Every, it was known throughout the valley. Locals went there too. Locals went there too. Everybody went there. It was known for banquets. It was known. For, she was known for her 
um, in the morning before she served anything for, for a breakfast or a, even a dinner. She had um, a, 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 a fried dough that, that she um, made and served with maple syrup and she was known for that because that was always served there. Every time you went there, you got her little um, fried dough cakes and, and it was delicious. She ran the, the hotel and she rented out both to trans people who were traveling through. She also had boarders who were there on a permanent basis. When did Mrs. Ahern run this from approximately from oh, when to when? She ran it from probably the early 20s. My, my aunt and uncle worked there. My aunt was a chambermaid and a cook there, my aunt Minnie. And my uncle Tade Reagan was the bartender in the Hot L. Warren, and they were longtime employees. They, that was their life work. They worked there all their life. And um, so I would say that she began pretty much the turn of the century and went on. I know she was there in 1943 because my brother had his wedding reception there, and it was Mrs. Ahern who served us our dinner. And what was there before Mrs. Ahern? When did the hotel start, do you think? I don't have the date that, that, that actually started, but there were many there, there were many owners because the hotel went through transformation when um, well, when the gas house explosion occurred, they had to the, the, all of the windows in the hotel Warren were broken, and they had to do a, a tremendous renovation project in order to get back in business. When that was time. that explosion? Can you tell it, us about that? 1908. Can you tell us about that? What happened? Uh, yes. Um, there was a leak in the, the gas house was located right next door where Baranowski Cleaners is located on Elm Street, on the south side of Elm Street, right next to the Hot L. Warren. There's only a driveway in between right now. What's a gas house? What is that? Well, it, that it was all gas. Uh, powered. All of the lights, the, the street lights in town were gas powered. Mm -hmm. uh, the houses were gas powered. They had pipes going into the homes? Yes, they, they did. And, I, and I, I can't tell you about that because that was certainly before my time. But I do know that when somebody reported a gas leak at the gas house, and three men, Mr. John Ockington, who also owned the saddle shop where the Hotel Warren is located, because that's what was it, uh, the footprint of the Hotel Warren before the Warren was there. It was a saddle shop. And Mr. Ockington owned it, a, a Mr. Uh, Fred Beeman and a Mr. S uh, Samuel Staffords were the three men that went into the gas house with lighted oh. lanterns. And the minute they went through the door, the explosion occurred killed all three of them. My dad was trapping at that time down in the Hatfield Swamp, and he heard the explosion and saw the fire that came up from that gas house explosion. So that's how far away that sound carried. But it, um, it de devastated, of course it destroyed the building. It, uh, they then had to um, go in and clean up the area and I think that they then went to electricity because I don't think they ever had gas again. And Skabitsky was in the back of the building? Skabitsky Farm Supply was out back. It originally was the livery stable for the Hot L. Warren. That's what the Skabitsky Farm Supply building was originally. Was the Is that still standing? No, it isn't. It's, it's, there's a driveway that goes through and that building was moved back into the back part of that commercial area that is fronted by the laundry on one side and Elm Street on the other side. It's in that back and I it's now so. an apartment building. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So what happened to the Hot L. Warren in the 40s and 50s and 60s? It basically, after Mrs. Ahern left, of course, I think a lot of her clientele also left and it just began to go on a downward spiral. Uh, numerous people took it over, but were not able to make a go of the business. It, it is, has a bar, and the bar has still remained active, and still does to this day, but it is more of a place where people, where the, the hunters meet, and the, the guys meet after bowling, and that kind of thing, to go in and have a, a little bit of libation before they go home. 
It's a single room occupancy now. Lots of people live there in little rooms, correct? Oh yes, because it, it was three stories at that time. And it has deteriorated tremendously. They have done things in the co forms of coats of paint to try to upgrade it, but probably, truly, it, sh it should have a, a total renovation by somebody who could restore it to its original uh, capacity as a restaurant. How come there were so many fires? It seems well, like every time, you know, another hotel, fire. Yes. Another, how come? Well, of course, that was a three-story hotel, and they had to heat the house some way, and so they had either a, a wood-burning furnace, and lots of times the uh, heat expansion would blow the door of the, of the stove open, and coals would come out on the floor, and if it did, it would start the floor burning or uh, uh, set something else on fire. And then once it got roaring, it was very hard to put, take under, bring under control. And that happened at, at the um, uh, Bloody Brook Inn on at least three occasions. One occasion was uh, when the Ockington saddle shop spilled some, something into the shavings and the shavings caught fire. And that fire completely destroyed from the what is we know as the Hotel Warren, which was then the Ockington Saddle Shop, all the way through to the center of town to where South Main Street exists, because the Hayden Hotel was on the corner of South Main Street and Elm, and that got destroyed in that fire. And so then it was a rebuilding process for all the stores in, in between the Hayden Hotel, which then became the foot, that was the footprint of the Redmond's Hall on the corner of South Main and Pleasant and uh, Elm Street, and then they rebuilt. Other. Tell me about Redmond Hall, what that was all about. Well, Redmond's Hall, Redmond organization was an organization of men in town, which I, I believe had its beginnings from the Indian influence that was pre prevalent in this area, the Bloody Brook Massacre. Um, the men had an organization which they called the Red Men. The ladies had an organization which they called the Pocahontas. And they all met regularly. Um, they did things similar to the Rotary Club does today. Uh, they did good works and good deeds, but they had a lot of events. They would sponsor different things. And they were located in offices in the first floor on the back of the building in Redmond's Hall. Now Redmond's Hall was, was a tall building and there, were, there was a, a dance floor on the second floor and a stage where, you, where they could show movies. Um, a lot of weddings were held there, a lot of bazaars, church bazaars were held there. Um, a lot of um, dancing. Oh, when they had the Polish weddings, they were dancing until after midnight there. Now, when, the, when you come downstairs onto the ground floor of that building of Redmond's Hall, it was um, John Morrissey's grocery store located in the, in, the, in the part on Elm Street that goes toward the railroad station. Um, beyond, uh, in front of that was the William the McNerney Insurance Agency, which was then the William Morrissey Insurance Agency, had offices in there. There was um, a room on the back that we held Girl Scout meetings in. It was an organizational type, well, it's probably where the Pocahontas had their meetings. But it was open to the town, so if you needed a meeting place, you had a place to go. And um, the Morrissey Grocery Store was run by John Morrissey and his three sisters. And that was there from the time I came into town until probably the late 60s when John died and, and all of the girls retired from the business. And where was that exactly again located? That was on the back side of the Redmond's Hall. It was now, where was Redmond's Hall? Where was Redmond's, Redmond's Hall? Redmond's Hall was on the corner of South Main Street and Elm Street. Right on the corner. And the postal department was in there too? That was in the corner, right yeah. diagonally in the corner. Diagonally faced the common when the post office department was in there. And I can remember going in there. Right, so this was quite a hub. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. What happened to the Redmond building? Well, eventually the, um, they ceased to organize and did not have their meetings. 
the, the rooms were open for anybody that wanted to go in, like, like I said, the Girl Scouts went in there. But um, the organization ceased, ceased to exist. Why is the building no longer there? Probably because it would have required a great deal of upkeep and renovation to conform to today's code and was no longer a viable building in the eyes of the townspeople. Mm -hmm. Got it. Right. So and it was, was it was down. destroyed. It when was, was that? In the 50s? Torn down. 60s? Early 60s. Early 60s. Yeah. And the Lathrop Hotel is where Jerry's place is now? That's correct. And McGrath has people living upstairs there? Is That's that correct? correct. That's, That's correct. that location. But you see, that was a three-story hotel, as I said, at one time, On too. the corner there of? Of uh, North Main Street and Elm Street. Okay. Um, let's go through some other places that come to mind. For instance, Elm Farm, the bakery, yes, on that corner there, across from the Hot L Warren. Yes. What was in there originally in that building? Originally, in the left side was Paturix Market. It was a grocery store. There were a lot of grocery stores. A lot in of town. grocery oh, stores. A lot of grocery stores, and they all prospered. Um, in the other side was, at least I believe, where the GAR Hall was located because the meetings were held up on the second floor of that building. Um, there were numerous, uh, the, the Paturix Market expanded into that at one time, and uh, then it became the Elm Farm Bakery when, um, in, in later years. And now, of course, Elm Farm Bakery is out of there, and it's now a, one side is a beauty parlor and the other side is, I have no idea. There's a yoga studio and there's okay, electrolysis yoga, okay. there. Yeah. But out behind that was the Ostrowski Bakery. And he was the Polish baker who baked the Polish bread. And it was more or less of a very flimsily constructed building because of the heat of the hearth. They had to be very careful because he had a hearth where he baked all his bread and it was all done with long handled paddles when they put the bread in to bake and you could smell that bread bacon all over town. It was delightful. And he ran a, a bakery store where you could go in and buy the, the loaves. But he also ran what I call a, a truck um, route that went around town to all the outlying districts where he would sell the bakery products to the people that couldn't get in to buy at the store. When did he go out, Ostrowski? He, he didn't go out. He moved across the street to where the building of the uh, Holiday Pizza and Taekwondo, he was in where the Taekwondo was. But there were many other people who were also in that building that had businesses there throughout the years. And where the uh, pizza place in, what was there before? That was um, going way back originally, it was the plumbing shop of Robert Gorey, and then it became the, the, the electrical shop of C.E. Parsons before he moved up street. And then it became, I lost track of it after that, um, because then about that time is when the bakery moved. And, um, but it was always active. There was always businesses in there. Uh -huh. Speaking about the Polish bakery, tell me about the Polish market on Thayer Street. How far back does that go? That's a very popular place where right. to buy Polish products. The history of the Polish bakery on, on, on Thayer Street was run by Stanley Boren. Stanley Boren went to the pavilion at the foot of Sugarloaf Mountain disassembled the lumber from that building and brought it to the bakery to the to the, to the, to the Polish store and installed it as the flooring and the sidewalls in that store and it remains there today that's still the lumber from the pavilion that stood at the foot of Sugarloaf Mountain uh -huh. so I could dance in that store if I wanted well, to no no I'm afraid you couldn't <laughs> but uh, then it, 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 Mr. Boren ran it and he also ran a truck where he took groceries around uh, to all the outlying districts. And that times. Polish market has continued successfully. Yes, to this however, day. it's not under the Borns because it was taken over from Stanley by three of his sons, actually four of his sons, but one split off and went to Thorndike to conduct his own grocery business down there. Three of the sons, Ray and Fred 
and uh, um, another son by the name of Stanley took over. Then Stanley dropped out and left only Fred and Ray to do the business. Ray did the meat cutting and Fred did the groceries and Fred's wife Terry was the clerk there and that was in business for an awful long period of time. And then I'm going to say that this Polish grocery moved in about eight to ten years ago, but they run a Polish business because they, they're Polish. they cater, they're Polish speaking ladies, they cater to the Polish people, they make the Polish people's Kielbasa, favorite foods, right. and they serve terrific grinders. They're a mecca for everybody passing through that needs their lunch because everybody stops there to have their Speaking grinders. Speaking about made. the Polish um, deli, the Polish American Club. Okay. When did that come to town? And Polish, that's a, that's a very big building. Polish American Club. Now that, that you speak of that, started where Pechur, the other side where Pechurek's Market was in the GAR Hall. Oh. That was the first meeting of the Polish Society, and they decided they needed a building of their own, and they built. That, oh, they built that building very soon after. I would say between 1930 and 1932, that building was built. And then, they, of course, they built the, the, prime, the front part of the building, and then they added on the hall afterward, and then later added the bathrooms on, and uh, have, have provided a place for people to, to hold um, dinners, gatherings, reunions. So Everything. this is really a gathering place for Polish oh, yes. Americans. Oh, this definitely. is the place. Well, you realize it's a, it's a, there's a very dense Polish population here. Um, probably half, at least, of the people were Polish at one time or another. Tell us about uh, Sugarloaf Street and the firehouse on. Okay. Um, the firehouse was built because back in the days before the building of the firehouse, the, the firemen pulled apparatus with um, like you would when you were saddling a horse up to it in order to, to pull the, uh, the apparatus. But they pulled it by hand and it was manned by a dozen men. They pulled it to the fire. Um, it was a hose situation where they were able to drop a hose into a brook and to put out the fire that way um, because there were no pumpers that stored water in those days. Then they discovered that they needed a fire engine so they bought a fire engine, and then they didn't have a place to put it. So then they decided they need a fire house. So they built the building on Sugarloaf Street that adjacent to the brook um, on the uh, uh, mm, west, east side of Sugarloaf Street. And um, that was built in about uh, the 1930, late 1930s. About 1938 by WPA. Yes. The, the that was one of the building. work projects that, um, that the, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps also had a hand in because they, uh, I think they, they drew all of the, the brick and the stuff for it uh, to, to help build that place. But after they built the fire station, then they discovered that they needed a bigger fire station because they got a bigger truck and it wouldn't fit in the fire station. <laughs> So that's when they expanded the doors and, they lowered, and the lowered the floor floors. in order to go in. Now, I'm going to mention the flood because the flood of 1936, which we have pictures of, flooded from the center of town all the way down to Sugarloaf Street and was caused by the runoff of the mountain into the brook and the brook overflowed. And I was always told that there are pictures, I've never seen it, of somebody paddling a canoe through the fire doors into the fire station. But I've never seen the picture. But it did, it did flood the, the floor of the fire station and all of the area in between. Now, next to the fire station was the Peterkin block, which was a, a large it, first it was a single family home and then was turned into apartment buildings. And that's working our way north on the street. The Peterkin block was later raised to make room for the um, bank building that was put in there that now has become the Arts Bank. Deerfield Arts Bank. The Deerfield Arts Bank. Beyond that was what was known first as the fertilizer building. 
It also how, it, and I think that the, originally when, when onion growing was rampant, I think their offices were in there in the fertilizer building because they had to they had to have some place to conduct their business. Where is that exactly the fertilizer That's building? That's what is now the CESA, okay. what is known as the CESA building. It's the same building. It's the same building, but it was then turned into the Light and Power Company. That's right. Is where they had their substation and they had parked their truck <laughs> that it was a very primitive chuck with the ladders on the side and the men riding on behind. That's the way they went from street light to street light to replace bulbs and uh, put up the ladder and get up there and change the bulb. But that was way, way bit back before. So they were storing onions in that building? That no, no, no. Originally? No, no, that's not where the onion storage was. Where was the that? onion storage was Risley's Garage. Risley's uh -huh. Garage had the onion storage because when Risley took it over, there were dried onions that he had to back a track, a, a pick, um, dump truck in, and they unloaded, I believe he said, three dump truck loads of dried onions that had been stored in bags upstairs and left and deteriorated there before he could take it over as a, a garage for his funeral business. Uh, speaking about Risley's Garage, that's directly across the Polish American Club, approximately. Not, not quite. Yeah, in that area. It, it's um, it's more across What's from the parking lot of Wolfies. Wolfies. Okay, uh -huh. but we need to go back to um, uh, the the CISA building because yes. then it was turned into apartment buildings, and it, many people lived there. Oh. Um, I know Les Thomas was there. He and Jean lived there for one at, at one time. Uh, there were many families that were there for a number of years that, that rented from there. And then it became the offices of um, Gordon Ainsworth, who was the surveying company in town. Mm -hmm. And at one time, the front part of it also was the office of the superintendent of schools, because I spent time in that office as well in my 40 years that I was with the school department. And then it was turned um, after it was turned back into um, turned over to uh, 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 Gordon Ainsworth. Uh, after Gordon died, then um, uh, Corey Rose took it over. He was Gordon's right hand man, and upon the demise of Gordon, he took the business over and bought it. And um, uh, that's where my husband went to work, and he worked there for 17 years for. Gordon Ainsworth. Doing what? As surveying. He, the first job he had after we got married was working on building the Massachusetts Turnpike. And then from there they went on an extensive job building the roadway up into Vermont. Okay, so and the next building is a produce net across the street across there? Across the street would be the Produce National Bank. Uh, can yeah. you tell us about that bank, what was in there, okay. or what you're a member of it? Um, yes, in the Produce National Bank, Walter Gorey mm -hmm. was the treasurer and chief financial officer, and he lived upstairs in the apartment for years and years and years. Um, Mr. Taplin, who was the chief cashier, and he oversaw saw the work of all the girls. And of course, back at that, in those days, you know, everything, nothing was computerized. They only had a, a like a cash register that they kept the money in. Fortunately, I don't ever remember anyone robbing that bank. That, that bank went untouched. But it stayed there, and after the bank moved over to become Greenfield Savings Bank on the corner of Conway Street and North Main Street, that was turned into town offices, and the town business was conducted from there. The town accountant was out back in the offices that were out back, which formerly was the place where the telephone company had their network set up. And um, when, when the building was decided to be vacated, then it was bought by a local contractor who has turned it into different types of business enterprises. Gordon Ainsworth also had downstairs under the Produce National Bank. That's where he started, was under the bank. And then they moved over to the fertil what we call the fertilizer I, th building. I think the police station was down there. The police station was also down there, and they had a lockup down there. Right. Yep. 
I think the man who owns it now is the grandson of the Protoss National person, one of them. That's what um, I was told. It, it's, it is uh, uh, one of the Gory boys that does own it. Okay. But no, um, no because that man didn't have any children. This okay. is another Gory, the, okay. the, the, the grandson. The next building next to the Protoss National okay. Bank that is? Was the, that was the C.C. McCutcheon uh, store. He had a gas pump out front, pump gas. Uh, did um, bicycle repairs, sold bicycles, um, anything you wanted in the line of a part he could furnish. Um, and he conducted that business all my younger years. That was always C.C. McCutcheon. And what's there now? Dr. Reed, correct? That's Dr. Reed, yes. It's, Who's expanded the building. Yes, but, yeah. yes it did. But that was also the post office in between the time. After C.C. McCutcheon moved out, they didn't do any renovations. They just moved the post office department in and um, put in the, the, the boxes, the lock boxes for mail pickup. Uh -huh. And um, they, they stayed there until they moved from there to the, where the postal department built the new on Sugarloaf Street. On Sugarloaf down. Street. But when they were, when they were in C.C. McCutcheon's building, I used to have to get up about 3 o'clock in the morning, ride my bicycle down to the drugstore. And in those days, we had to write the names on the morning newspaper so that we could then bundle them by street and how they went out through the postal department, then carry them across the street to the post office and I made many trips across the street in the morning. Usually I finished up about six o'clock and then I was ready to start work on the soda fountain. But um, that building was a postal department at that time and, and then remained such. Coming around the curve, we come to... Come to you, come to the, what you originally used, well, first of all, after C.C. McCutcheon, which is now the uh, offices of Dr. Reed on Park Street in South Deerfield on the Common, um, there was a, a Methodist church. That's where the Methodist church stood. And in one of the photographs that I have, if you look from the CESA, what we call the CESA building, if you looked at the Produce National Bank, you will see the backside of the Methodist church there. It was before it was raised. But there was a fire and, and, the, and the building burned. And, and when that building was the the church building was there that was also where sears plumbing started their plumbing business because they then moved from there over to elm street and then beyond that after the church building when the space became available uh, there were two hosley brothers in town who decided to go into the garage business the garage that was built there was are we talking where the Methodist Church is? Where the Methodist Church used uh -huh. to be, where right. the detailing, auto detailing oh, shop okay. is now. Good. Um, one Hosley brother handled that, and that handled all the grease jobs and oil changes and um, minor details. They, um, they did a big business. They only had one bay at first, and then they went to two bays when business became um, quite uh, prominent in town. But the other brother went up on North Main Street. And up on North Main Street, just this side of where the Pelican industry is now, on the west side of North Main Street, stands an orchard right now. It's, it's probably apple trees that, that are there, and it's quite extensive. But that was where the North Main Street Hosley Garage was located. Now, that was where they did major car overhaul. That was where the maintenance was done. Anybody who needed their engine replaced or tires changed or, or buy a new car. You could buy a new car there. And coming down the street, what's, what's next that you'd like to... Uh... Well, if we, if we turn the corner and look in a westerly direction on the corner of Conway Street and North Main Street, where the Greenfield Savings Bank is now located, that was the home of Waldorf Amerstein. And it was a large, large structure, had three stories to it. But on the second story, the reason I remember it is because that's where the medical offices of Dr. Moline was, were located. And the next thing that, that happened to that building was, of course, that it was torn down. 
um, basically the Greenfield Savings Bank was put in its place, uh, being the bank that replaced the Produce National Bank when the Produce National Bank ceased to be a bank. If we then continue in a southerly direction on the square where you're looking across the street to the common, there was the home of John Leary, who was the town lawyer at one time. He brought up his family there. And then the next house was the house of Connie Monahan. And um, there is a story to tell about Connie Monahan's house. Um, Connie was a, a, a good old Irish man, and uh, he liked to take a nip on the bottle every now and then. And his wife did not like him when he was nipping on the bottle. So she was in a constant frenzy because he was constantly at the bottle. All of a sudden, one day, Connie went missing, and he disappeared, and nobody could find him. And they searched, and they searched, they searched everywhere. Now, between the house of Connie Monaghan and John Leary was a chicken coop. And it seems that Connie, when his wife was hollering at him, had a big old overstuffed chair out in that hen house. And he went out there to sleep off his nip of the bottle. Well, after the searching continued for a number of months. Months? Months. All of a sudden, when the chicken coop was about to be destroyed, unfortunately, there sat Connie Monahan in the chair in that chicken coop, and that's where he was all the time. What year was that approximately? 1951-52, right around that time. And what's in those houses now? Nothing. They're gone. They were torn down to make way for the parking lot that uh, exists uh, that used to be for the market in the building next door that is in the footprint of where the Lathrop Hotel was, which was a grocery store, and they used the vacant lots for parking lots for that um, business. And then the other lot on the other side where John Leary's house is basically um, used, I think it was intended to be used as a parking lot. So there's nothing that exists there now. And then, of course, if we go on to the grocery store, Walter Suzetek operated a grocery store there for a number of years. And he had... Where was that exactly? That was in where the grocery store exists next to Jerry's place. Uh -huh. And then after Walter Suzetek was uh, finished, one of the Watroba boys came in and took it over and ran a very successful grocery store and kind of a takeout lunch type situation. But you could go there and buy anything. And then when Mr. Watroba finished, um, it became vacant and then was taken over by um, another um, a Mr. Patel. And that did not last very long. And now the, the store is vacant at this moment. And then, of course, you have Jerry's Place. These were the two businesses that are in the bottom half of what was the Bloody Brook house. So let's continue on Conway Street. right? Where okay. On the corner of Conway Street, actually it sits on North Main Street, is the old South Deerfield Elementary School. I went to first and second grade there. They also at one time had third and fourth grades there when we had an influx of children that were born in the boom that started just before World War II. After we finished grades one and two there, and I've had, I have a picture of my second grade class on the front steps of that building. Uh, taken, and um, it, it's one I cherish because it was most of the young people who then went on with me and followed through to Deerfield High School. Now the senior center is in that building in the, on the main floor, and then I know that the uh, VFW Post 3295 has offices downstairs. Also downstairs, when I was in the superintendent's office, which was also temporarily located in that building. The town accountant was located out back on the first floor, and the welfare offices were downstairs in the cellar. And that's where the rationing board was, where you went to get your ration stamps during World War II. When you say welfare offices, what are you referring to? Well, I'm referring to uh, help that people needed. Uh, in those days, it was the forerunner of what is now food stamps and people on welfare receiving uh, monthly stipends to help them along. Um, people in those days 
needed welfare as well. It was not as popular or prevalent as it is today. However, people did need help. But they had an office because they, people had to go in and register, and of course you had to present your credentials. And there was a, a clerk and um, a person who was the uh, head manager of the building that were in that office. What, what period is that we're talking about when they had a welfare office there? That is the period of about 19, probably 49, 50, 51, and 52 when I was there, but the welfare office con was, was there before our superintendent's office was located there. Mm -hmm. So it, it was in that building from the time World War II started, because rationing started, of course, with World War II. I believe also on the third floor was a basketball court, is that correct, at the old grammar school? Yes. Uh, An getting, early basketball court. Getting back to that old building, there were two floors of school space, and then the third floor on the top was the f original basketball court before Deerfield High School was built that all of the boys, the local boys, went up there to play basketball. Now, I have to tell you of my experiences as a Girl Scout, because when we were Girl Scouts, we decided we were going to climb up to that floor. But at that time, there was no stairway, so we had to go up by a ladder that we obtained to get to that third floor. I think that with the uh, a building getting older and with Deerfield High School being built and having a gymnasium, the need for that court diminished. And so, therefore, the boys ceased to play up there. Also, it was a long trip up there. It still exists. Though. It still exists, still there. Let's continue on Conway Street. All right. Um, from Conway Street and the and the old elementary school, then the new bu building was built. The new elementary school, which is was on the footprint of the current town hall and Deerfield Police Station, and that housed grades uh, three through eight because at that time we were not regionalized. And we went from the old elementary school over to that building. And in my day, there were so many of us that we had two grades, two classes of each grade, all the way through, high, through elementary school and into high school. Uh, and of course, the, old, the, the, new high, the new elementary school then had to accommodate all of the, the additional grades. And, and that, we, we all had, we had great teachers. They, I remember every one of my teachers that I had. Can you name a few that were outstanding, who had a great impact on you? Well, it made an impact mm -hmm. on me. For instance, Miss Whitlock was my first grade teacher. She was a maiden lady. Mrs. Ethel Morrissey was the second grade teacher. Her husband died while we were in their second grade class. Then I went on to the third grade, who was Mrs. Eddy. And then the fourth grade was a Miss Edwina Fish. A fifth grade was Miss Tarrant. Sixth grade was Maple Moody. And then the seventh and eighth grades, the two teachers shared, the principal shared the seventh and eighth grade, and Miss Margaret Nealon also shared the seventh and eighth grade, and Charles Taylor was the name of the principal. And they, I can't say that I have any one teacher that was outstanding because they all made an impression on me. They really did, they were good teachers. And how many students were there in a class at that time? This is, we're talking late 1930s, correct? Late 1930s. Now, I've, having been in the school department, there was not a quota on the numbers of students at that time. It just depended upon if the student body got over 40 or 45, they would split it up and go a, a, a split between the, to, to make the two classes. But they tried to uh, have as few in the class, but there were many classes we had that were 35 in those days, and the teacher handled that number. What became of the elementary school? How come it was torn down? Well, the elementary school was a great school. I can remember it being heated by coal, and the worst thing that was the coal gas that we smelled every day in the heating season, because naturally there was a central a uh, heating system and a central chimney that, chimney that went up and it just exhausted fumes into the upstairs. I don't know why we all, weren't all overcome, but anyway. Um, many times uh, in the course of the elementary school education, they wanted a, a new elementary school and of course they then decided to regionalize and when they did, 
they, that was still the South Deerfield Elementary School because there still was an elementary school in Old Deerfield that handled all of the Old Deerfield kids. And it wasn't until the new school was built on um, Pleasant Street in, on the, what they called Dwyer Lot that they then had no need for the school building in South Deerfield. Now, to the South Deerfield Elementary School, we had no cafeteria programs when we went to school, so we had no lunches. But they had built on to the South Deerfield Elementary School four classrooms plus a cafeteria auditorium sort, sort of affair. It's, it's the one that exists today. That was the original cafeteria for the South Deerfield Elementary School. And then, of course, when the need to regionalize came along um, and Old Deerfield closed, they built the new school and on Pleasant Street, and that's where all the classes from Old Deerfield and South Deerfield moved into. The building then became vacant for a while, although it was still used as town offices. They used the newer part of it for town offices, and then, of course, demolished the part that was the old elementary school part, and that building a new police station on that footprint, but retaining the four classrooms and the gymnasium cafeteria, which exists as our town hall today. That was early 1990s around, is that right? That happened? Um, Approximately. Perhaps a little before that. Um, the year escapes me right at the moment. Uh, the region was formed in 1956, so that's when we, we became regionalized, but the old Deerfield Elementary School continued on after that period of time. So what you're saying is you didn't get to know children from Deerfield? No, no. You just knew kids from South Deerfield, West Deerfield, East Deerfield? No, West Deerfield and East Deerfield went to Old Deerfield. They went to South Old Deerfield. South Deerfield and the surrounding area to South Deerfield went to South Deerfield. Okay. But the, the configuration that was that the bus route did an uh, East Deerfield, Old Deerfield, West Deerfield turn and then deposited those children at Old Deerfield. Deerfield. So what was across the street now from the, uh, what's now the town uh, well, offices? Well, um, some years ago, probably in the late 1960s, the New England Telephone Company built uh, a building as a substation as t the need for up more upgraded telephone lines and um, systems were put into play. So the, it's the New England Telephone building that was put in there. And then there was a vacant area in the square between Conway Street, Elm Street, North Main Street, and Conway Street. And in that center of the square was built the Berkshire Brewing Company. And that exists today um, as, a, as, a growing, as a very growing business. Uh, so let's do the loop around now. Okay. There was a street that went through there. Yes, and I don't know that it ever had a name. I think we always called it North Street as well as the existing North Street that's on the opposite side of the tracks. But it goes around the corner by the, what was the Mastalis House on the corner. And before it goes across, Conway Street in those days went straight through across the tracks right. and over to a traffic light on what is the now existing the bypass for South Deerfield, and then went straight through. It did not go up uh, a short distance by the fire station and then turn and go over 91 because there was no 91 there at that time. So it went straight through to Conway, and then the existence of building of 91 made it, they, they had to reroute it. I skipped across from the electric, from the telephone company, uh, oh, was yeah. the, the plumber is there. Uh, Mal Siki's Malsiki. office was on the north side of, of Conway Street just before you went over the railroad tracks and then there was also a house there that people lived in that, that still exists today. That's a very old house. A very old house, yes. Let's continue down that street. Down, north, uh, down the street by the, uh, by the railroad station? Yeah. There's a set of old buildings that, that still exist today probably only half of what existed originally. And in my day, as I remember it, they were used for storing of freight. Um, if people had something coming in that, that they couldn't pick up immediately and did not want to leave out to wet in the weather, 
It was put into those buildings until it could be picked up by a truck and then delivered to the business. Um, it was, uh, I think, a grain storage part at one time. And then getting on down toward the crossing was where the original South Deerfield Railroad Station was located. And immediately across from the street, that so-called, that I've named North Street, was the Leader Lumber Company. So now we come to the intersection of this North Street and Elm Street just before you go across the railroad crossing. Let's go right now. Let's okay. turn right. All right. We now face, as we go right, we face what today has a um, ice cream stand. Yes. That was an empty lot. That was all. That was empty lot, excepting for the Worthmore Feed building that stood where the new replica of a of a, of a station, a railroad station, sits on the left hand side. That was not there. That's where the Worthmore Feed building was and they housed all of the grain and feed that farmers came in to buy to you know, feed their stock with or um, to uh, have things, uh, seed for sow uh, sowing in their fields. And then if you go beyond the fertilizer feed where the uh, Habitat for Humanity, that big building did not exist. That was an empty lot and then the, a road went down to the old, what was called the Old Deerfield Fertilizer building and that's where the farmers went to get with their trucks to pick up their loads of fertilizer in the springtime to put on the onion crops and the tobacco crops and, and, and their basic corn and, and grain crops. And uh, across the street from across Habitat... The, across the street from Habitat is the ice cream stand. I, and mean, I mean the other corner there is become used to be a funeral home. Behind it, yeah. uh, continuing on down that street, yeah. was a funeral home. It was the Drosdell Funeral Home for a number of years. Uh, the Drosdell Funeral Home was originally started on Thayer Street with the Lipinski Funeral Home, and it was run by Drosdell's uncle. Uh, and when Mr. Lipinski died, the young Drosdell man came in, took over the uh, business in its original state there on Thayer Street, but did not continue there. He went over there to the corner of Elm and um, Route 5 and 10 and built that new building. And of course now he operated it probably for a period of 10 years and then has closed that and gone down to Northampton where he has his main uh, funeral home business. I remember next to that building, behind it, was a florist. Yes, it was. It was Does that the, go back a ways? Oh yes, that goes back to when well, we're going to relocate in town here, but it was back when the when the floral shop was originally where Dunkin' Donuts and the uh, Irving gas station is. Oh. That's where the flower shop started. And before that, it was a home that was on that property. And it happened to be the home of the state building inspector who lived in town at that time. But anyway, not to, not to cover that totally here. Um, the, the flower shop moved from that location over to beside the Drosdell Funeral Home on Elm Street. And um, that continued in business for a number of years. Oh, uh, I would say at least 20, 25 years. And then they went out of business. Something came in there to replace it, but I'm not aware of, of what took up the space uh, at that time. And across the street, down on the corner there is the People's United Bank? Um, before you get to the United Bank, after we go across the railroad crossing, to your immediate right is North Street, the, the or named North Street. And as you go down that street, there are two businesses. There's, there's Militech business now, oh, yes. and the uh, business of uh, the, the uh, refab. Um, Deerfield, Deerfield Valley. Deerfield Valley refabbing. And, of course, there was nothing in there when I was growing up. That was all vacant land. Also, on the opposite side of the driveway is storage sheds, and it was the original building built when Leader Lumber, which is now located on the corner of Elm Street and what I named as North Street, was moved over there into that large building. They were there for probably four, five years. Then they moved back to their original location where they are now. And um, Yankee Candle had an antique car 
display which they put into that building and they had that for some years. Not very long, probably four or five years. Then they moved the car, antique car display back to the original home building there on routes 5 and 10 and then they disappeared from the displays at Yankee Candle. In that building today is some computer related company. It's yes it is and they, they seem to be um, uh, doing a, a, a going business because there's always a lot of cars parked around there. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the name of the new company. And this was all empty land for a long all time. All empty land, all empty land at one time. And probably built up in the 1950s, 1960s, would you say? Probably the 60s when the, when, uh, the, the lumber company moved, when Leader Lumber moved over there. Um, that proximate dates of time. Okay, so where shall we go now from? Let's go across Elm North, Street. Let's yeah. continue on Elm Street because Elm Street went from the intersection at the center of Deerfield, South Deerfield, out Elm Street, across the railroad tracks, across what is now the bypass, across Route 91, and continued straight on to um, the Waitley, what we call now Waitley Road, and went on down and came in up on the main street in the town of Waitley. But that was the throughway in the, in those days. Now you have to do a couple of jogs in the in the road in order to get over to the back part of that Wakeley Road section. I, I do want to mention Dr. Schmidt also, right? The veterinarian. Yes, yes he was he's across. a veterinarian, and he is across five and the, the route bypass five and ten. Before you get to ninety one, there's a small section of there of way there, and that's where the Swan Pickle Factory used to be. And on the opposite side, on the north side of that street, is where Dr. Schmidt's veterinarian service is. And Dr. Schmidt's been there for a number of years. Dr. Schmidt's probably been there for at least 30, 35 to 40 years. Let's go to North Main Street. Okay. Well, where would you like to start? Well, let's start at the Masonic Hall. Um, there was a, there's a Masonic Hall, or a building that used to, I still know it is the Masonic Hall. It was where all the Masonic meetings the Masons of town met there, and for years and years, as far back as I was a child, had their meetings there. Uh, the building after the Masons, um, I don't think they disbanded, but I think they gave up the building and sold it, and it has it remained vacant for a lot of years, and then uh, has become a, a bookstore. Meeting house books. Meeting house books, and if we were to go north, and cross Brayburn Road, keeping on North Main Street. We approach on the east side of the street, the rectory for the Congregational Church. Let's talk about the Congregational Church, which is just beyond the Senior Center. And the Congregational Church and its meeting hall have been there for many years. They go back to the 1800s. Um, sitting next to that, used to be a, an apartment block and there were about six apartments in the building and that was known as the Tilton Block and it was a big two-story house. Um, many people lived there. Let's move to the Tilton Library. The Tilton Library has been there since I was a child and um, I believe it was formed um, by a donation of the Tilton family to the town and of course that block next door was also named the Tilton block um, which may have been where the Tilton family lived originally but the library um, originally you had, um, accessed it by going up the steep stairs out front there was never the elevator built on the side that's been a, a recent addition with the uh, addition onto the side but you came in and you came into the foyer and of course it was books to the left and books to the right and we did a lot of book searching because as children they always directed us to go to the library and that was part of our assignment so we took books, books out of there to read constantly and as a child um, I was a frequent visitor to that library. You were encouraged by your teachers? Oh, definitely. And did you do homework there too, or you just used no, it as... No, no, it was mostly to get books uh, uh -huh. to follow through on a subject matter that was discussed in school. It was a popular place to go very to. Very popular, very popular. Very well used back in those days. 
Let's continue on with the, with the North Main Street. On the west side of North Main Street sits the now vacant St. James Church. St. James Church was an original building that was owned by the Methodists that was up on the corner of Bloody Brook and it sat out behind the monument. In 1895, the Catholic Society decided they needed a Catholic church in town because there was none. Everybody was either having to go to Greenfield or Northampton. And they decided to move that church and they moved it on wooden rollers down the street being drawn by evidently oxen or whatever heavy, bearing, heavy weight bearing animals they could get. And they put it in place in its present location on that west side of the street. Now, in the original days, there were two front entrances, one for the men and one for the women. And the early pictures that I have still show those two front entrances there on the church. It was later, um, they did some renovation work and made one front entrance over the church. And I have to say, I think that was done about the time that Augustus Vincent Tack painted the triptych that was put inside the church over the altar. And he also painted, um, uh, had, had not painted, but had sculptured an angel and a Madonna um, plaque that went over the front entrance. That front entrance has been altered a couple of times, but not considerably from the original alteration. Uh, why was the church moved from North Main to its location there? Well, that religious sect moved on and vacated the site. Also, um, St. James at that time uh, had bought an, a, a large piece of property which they wanted to build to move the church to and to put a rectory on it. There was not room at North Main Street. Um, the people were walking to church. There were not many people who drove cars. People from the outlying districts didn't have cars, and so they didn't come into church that often. And those of us who lived in the, on the streets in the neighborhood um, came to walk to the church, and that's why they decided that they would put it onto rollers and roll it down the street and put it into where it exists today. Okay, let's continue now down the street. Okay, um, to where do you want to go? Well, there's, to nine, there's 94A North Main where the uh, Fred Bay, Rose Bay Vanson's Grill. Okay, you want to speak about the grill? Okay, that was there. Yes, um, at 94A North Main Street exists a building that used to, was built by Fred Rowe, who lived next door, and Fred Rowe worked in the GTD in daytime, and he ran that building at night as a restaurant. Now, this was a great hangout place for everybody who went to the basketball games and the baseball games afterward and after the football games. Uh, people stopped in there for their hamburgers and their hot dogs and their grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, it was a very primitive grill with just an open kitchen in the back, um, but he served a lot of people. After Fred Rowe stopped uh, serving food there. It was taken over by Babe Manson, who, um, who decided to continue on the business, and he uh, served food there, and it did the same thing after the football, the basketball, and the baseball games. Everybody trooped in there to have it some libation afterward. Um, as growing up, that was also one of the jobs I held. I was the cook behind the counter when Fred Rowe wasn't available. When he, when I would go in and open up lunch, noon times for lunches for passerbys through on Route 5 and 10. Anybody who wanted to stop for lunch, I served them. So Betty, why did the uh, grill stop being a grill? It was a popular place, people stopped there. Well, Babe Manson uh, went on to work elsewhere. Um, he went into the service. Uh, he was in the Navy, came back, and then went into another business venture and um, just closed the grill, and that's when it became an apartment house. Okay, let's continue across the street. Yes, that's the pocketbook shop. Pocketbook shop goes back a long way. There were probably 
at one time, five makers of pocketbooks in the town of Deerfield. It was the, by different names, it was the Arms pocketbook shop at one time. Mr. Arms lived on Pleasant Street in that big white house out at the end on the north side of Pleasant Street, just beyond the driveway into Frontier Regional. Um, it was also had different administrators. Um, um, Mr. Ed Arms, who was living in town, was one of the uh, foremen and administrators and, and a prominent person in the business. Back when they made pocketbooks, my mother worked there as a young girl, and so she had to have worked there probably between 1918 and 1920 when she was married. Um, then it became um, unused for a while. Then the, after the pocketbook business kind of petered out, uh, it remained vacant. And when World War II came in, my mother went back to work there because they were making writing tablets, leather writing tablets, for the men overseas so that they had a place to put their envelopes and their paper and their stamps and everything and you keep them in. I think it was an accepted uh, addition to their barracks bags so that they didn't have to d declare them uh, or throw them out. This was an enormous building. Oh, it, yes. it must have had hundreds upon hundreds of employees. It went through many different uh, renovations. First it had a cupola on top and then a cupola was missing and then they would add on one section on the north and then one end add a section on the south. Um, I think that it, I must have at least eight different series of pictures of different eras when the pocketbook shop looked different. When do you think it closed permanently? Well, after it was a pocketbook shop, it became a plastic shop. When do you think it closed approximately as a pocketbook? Are we talking 1950s, 60s? Oh, no, no. It was a little later than that, that I would say the, uh, the late, maybe the late 60s when the, well, when, when Deerfield Plastics was formed, they originally had been started in that pocketbook shop footprint and then moved, built a building and moved down and became the Deerfield Plastics. So um, that's about when the, the demise of the building became obvious because now that was an 1800 year old, the 1800s it was built. And I don't think they could measure up to the fire codes and the plumbing codes. As we became more sophisticated in our building codes, a lot of it caused the demise of the older buildings in town. You mentioned Deerfield Plastics. It makes me think of Hardig Industries. Can you tell us about Mr. Hardig and his company, what you know about it? It was a very successful business. Yes, he was. He, was born, he lived in Conway and built his business. Um, I believe he started up there to begin with and then needed room to expand, and that's when he came down here and built the buildings. Which are located on? Uh, on North Main Street, between North Main Street and the railroad, his business is located. Um, it did not start off, it started off as Harding Industries rather than Pelican, which it now is known as. Um, he was successful. Um, I, he employed a lot of, of people from the Valley, from Greenfield, from South Deerfield. Tommy worked there at one time. Um, he, I believe then as soon as it became Pelican, or was to become Pelican, that's when he sold the business and a new owner took over. Let's go down to Sugarloaf Street now. All right. So following the, continuing down the street from the firehouse, which is now 7 Sugarloaf Street, what do we find on Sugarloaf Street? At the corner of what is now Sugarloaf Street in Eastern Avenue, at the time the building was built, there was no Eastern Avenue there um, of, of great length, but there was a, an entry into the street. Uh, Mr. Sharkey had the big house that is on the left side on Sugarloaf Street of Eastern Avenue and on the right side there was a vacant building lot and he built a building that housed the, the uh, Sharkey Farm Supply Tractor Warehouse. It was a showroom for tra showing tractors to farmers, um, cultivating equipment, uh, all farm supplies at that time. Uh, that was his main business, 
and that's where he kept all of the um, implements that he stored for the drill room. And when did that leave? When did it end being there? Mr. Sharkey did not continue that business for um, too long a period of time and it became a vacant building and stayed a vacant building and then was converted into an apartment house. The next building we come to is um, the St. Stanislaus, which used to be known as St. Stanislaus Church. It was the, the Roman Catholic Church for the Polish people in South Deerfield. And in uh, 1927, there was a, a great split in, in the population of the Roman Catholic Church at St. Stanislaus. Some people um, wanted to break away and form another church which they did and formed the Holy Name of Jesus Church, which is now located on Thayer Street. And it split the, the population from St. Stanislaus pretty much in half. And there, it was not an, um, it was a very acrimonious split. There was a lot of anger and a lot of um, disappointment and people's lives changed because of it because all of a sudden now they become members of another church. And the, the holy name of Jesus Church is not under the, um, the Pope or the, or the Roman Catholic faith. So that was a big split in the center of town. Uh, that has continued, they, they had a rectory on the uh, east side of that church that remained the rectory for a number of years until very uh, recently, within the last uh, eight to ten years, the house on the opposite side of the church, in other words, the west side of the church, on Sugarloaf Street, the, formerly known as the Clinker House, was bought by the, the parish uh, to become a part of St. Stanislaus. However, in the meantime, it had been determined that there should be a merging of the Church of St. James, which is Roman Catholic, and St. Stanislaus, which was Roman Catholic, due to the death of our pastor. And then it was decided that the two churches should merge into one under a new name. And there was a great deal of um, let's say discourse over what the new name would be and finally it was decided because there is a picture on the ceiling in the church of the Holy Family the uh, Joseph Mary and the child that they would name it Holy Family Church and that's so the church it's so the, named. Um, Irish who used to go to St. James That's right. now joined the Polish. That's correct. There really was a schism. There was a real difference between the well, two churches. The Irish went to one, the Polish went to the, the other. Because the Polish church was always, the mass was always conducted in Polish, whereas the Irish church, it was always conducted in English. Not Latin. Not Latin. Well, yes, Latin way back. And then English. And then in English. And but, when did it stop being Polish? But let me say that St. James had a lot of, um, uh, People who came from S Slovakian countries uh, that were not deemed of ag Polish dialect uh -huh. then came to the St. James Church. We had a number of par parishioners who were of Hungarian, um, uh, other faiths that, that, that were members of our church. But of course, now we are all one under okay. Holy Family Church. Let's move on across the street. There's a small shop there. Yes. What was that formerly? That was the shop that belonged to the house of James Bednarski. It was who, a cider place. He, well, he, he, grew, he grew apples and, and uh, imported apples and made cider. That was his winter project. Uh, and he made delicious cider. I can remember going and picking up gallons of cider. It was the best cider I ever had. But I think he used that shop as his show place to, to display the cider so people could stop by and buy gallons. That was his roadside stand. And nearby was a tobacco shop? Uh, let, let, me, let me just skip next door to that, which is the church of the... Um, oh, Ukrainian. Ukrainian right? uh, faith, yes. And of course, that, of course, is a different faith, and there are many uh, Ukrainian people in the valley because there were a lot of 
immigrants who came from, from Europe that were not just Polish people or not just Russian people. They came from all countries. And therefore, they tried to set up a church that, that catered to whatever faith they had. So this one was the Ukrainian church. And that one came in. That Ukrainian church was there when I was a, was a child. So that one was formed probably about the same time that St. Stanislaus was formed. 1920s. 1920s, yes. OK, so we have this uh, cider shop the, then? Yes. And then we have the um, tobacco shop. The tobacco shop sits out in back of what was the two houses that, that Mr. Decker um, owned. He had a large amount of land holding. It went all the way to the mountain. It was used uh, for many agricultural crops, but mainly for shade-grown tobacco over the years. Um, the, all of the fields from there to the mountain, North Sugarloaf, South Sugarloaf was all under cultivation. There used to be five large barns down at the end of the mountain, right where the mountain begins to, to swing up into the uh, North Sugarloaf. That, that was the shop where they brought in the tobacco after it had been slatted, hung in the okay. barns to dry. That's now become a home, that former tobacco. Yes. It's been turned into to, to a home, yes. right? And those fields behind, we used to have tobacco and the tobacco barns, are now a major development done by Mr. Yes. Upton, correct? Yes, it's Crestview, and that, Crestview. that was put in, oh, Crestview's only been there six or seven years. I'd say 1995. I remember, okay. I remember being right. here and we had public meetings about Crestview. They, they started one or two buildings on it. And that's then, when they started. And, yes, and then it developed into um, some cul-de-sacs and some rather expensive homes were built out on the, uh, on the property. And now it is full. Yeah, and continuing then down the street, we come to Risley's Funeral Home. Risley's Funeral Home was located on Thayer Street and it was it was the uh, sec second house in on Thayer Street, and it, the funeral home itself was built in the back of the house. There was the house that's out front, which has been, somebody started to, to do renovations on that house, and I believe it was probably the Drosdale family, and they have just stopped in mid-project, so it remains halfway done. But out behind that is a low-slung building that was the funeral parlor. And it was it was an extensive building because it could handle two funerals at once. Nineteen thirties, nineteen forties. Oh, before, probably before. It was always always there, basically. Probably probably early early nineteen forties, maybe late nineteen thirties, because I remember it as being there most of my life. And the Risleys came in. Risleys didn't come in until um, the boys, um, both Harold and. And uh, Larry went to um, embalming school and graduated, came in and built that building there on Sugarloaf Street. Uh, they built it as um, an apartment building upstairs, which um, Larry and uh, uh, Harold's mother and father, Julia and uh, William R uh, Risley, lived there. And then the funeral home was built downstairs on the main floor. And then their offices and their embalming and their casket storage was located in the basement. Do you remember in the 1930s and 40s, did most people have formal funerals or oh, did no. they do it at home? Oh no, everybody, up until, up until about the late 1950s, 19, let's say 50, 58, 59, people were, were waked, what they call waked, from homes. At the, their home, at, at, their their home. at their parlor. The funeral their director would come in, move out the furniture, move in what they needed in order to set up the casket. Um, they would have the viewing in the house, and the house was set up to accept whatever people. In those days, an Irish wake was a two or three day affair. It started the day the person died, and it would go right on until after they, they were waked and after the, the burial. Irish wakes were in celebrations the, were celebrations. Yes, it was a celebration of life, and um, perhaps too much celebrating in some areas. But um, I can remember my grandmother being waked 
in our house up on North Main Street and my baby brother being waked in that house up on North Main Street. Those visions are still very, very vivid in my mind. And if one didn't own a home, I assume you went to a funeral home? Not, they did not have viewing parlors in those days that were, that were prominent. I mean, we never had one here. McCarthy Funeral Home in Greenfield did have viewing, a funeral parlor that you could go to. But it was mainly, they just did the funeral service, brought the casket to the home, set it up in the home, and then mm -hmm. did the breakdown afterward and what was necessary to conduct the funeral. That was the way the funeral homes conducted their business. It wasn't until, as I said, my mother, my father died in, in 58, and he was at the funeral home in Greenfield of, of McCarthy's. My mother died in 59, and she was at McCarthy's also. That was, that was before Risley's. If it had been Risley's, I would have been to Risley's because Risley's family. Was South Deerfield. In South Deerfield, right. Okay, as we continue down a little further, and we're going towards Sugarloaf Mountain, across the street at the base, there is something called uh, Trademark, which was formerly... That, that was a business that was formerly in the ground floor of the Redmond's Hall. It was an appliance business that started that building, and then when when Redmond's Hall became not used as a public building, they still continue to have that appliance store there. But when it became evident that it was going to be dismantled, um, the man who owned the, the appliance store went down to the location there at the foot of Sugarloaf Mountain. On the right-hand side as you're approaching the intersection, uh, s built that little shop and moved his business down there. Do you know his name? Um, it escapes me at the moment. Okay. Uh, I can't remember it, but it was. Was a, it Cohen? No, okay. no, it was not. But anyway, um, that's where he set up his business. Okay, now it's trademark realty. Now it's trademark. When realty. I said Cohen, I really meant across the street where the dentist is, right, Doctor Cohen? Yes, but Doctor, uh, the dentist that was there, was originally in McCutcheon's block, C.C. McCutcheon's block in the center of South Deerfield on Park Street. That's where Dr. Civic and Dr. Mahoney all started their dentist business and then moved down to that location, which was a house that they renovated a couple of side rooms, and that became the dentist office. But that has been, well, it's, it, it was back in the days of probably late 1940s, 50s at that era.